able to host them here at the Ringling Museum. Uh, today, we're very excited to welcome, or to welcome back, Sheila Sanders. Sheila spent many years working right here at the Ringling, um, and many of us knew her as the smiling face in accounting who would help us with all of our complicated paperwork questions, but she has an incredible life story outside of, of her work here at the museum. So today, she'll be in conversation with Vicki Oldham, Vicki is the founder and the director of Newtown Alive, which is an incredible organization preserving the history of that community. And I invite you to learn more about Newtown Alive and sign up for their email um, list at the table outside in the lobby when the program concludes. I also want to invite all of you to join us for a meet and greet with Sheila and with Vicki uh, in the Glass Pavilion, which is the gallery space when you exit the theater immediately to the left when the program concludes. Um, Finally, I just want to mention that this program is being recorded and will be accessioned into the museum archives where it will be accessible to scholars and students for years to come. Uh, that being said, please make sure your phone is on silent so that we don't have any uh, ringtones going off in our archival footage. Uh, before we get started today, I'm very pleased to introduce Brenda Wadi, who will sing a couple of songs to get us uh, all in the mood and ready for, for today's program. So I'm going to turn it over to Brenda. We always want to start this program off in song. And I don't know about you, but when the saints go marching in, I want to be in that number, don't you? So I need you to come up and stand up to your feet, and we're going to sing this together because singing is good for the soul. Would you agree? Yes. Oh, when the saints come on, go marching in. Oh, when the saints go marching in. Oh, happy day. When Jesus was, when 
is a happy day. And it is indeed a happy day. Yes. We sing, we sing at the beginning of all of our programs, this one on our trolley tours. We sing to convey a message. We sing because we need an uplifted spirit. And we sing because we need to remember the values of our, our ancestors. And so, Wherever you go and Newtown Alive is, <laughs> expect to sing. I'm so glad that uh, Brenda made it today. Brenda just flew in from Pittsburgh and she said that she would uh, be coming in at 7.30. And I said, well, Brenda, if you don't make it, then I guess I'll be singing this morning. <laughs> and that is all right, because I do sing on the trolley tour. Yeah. Uh, any trolley tour guests on out there? Yes, is that David? Good to see you, David. Thank you so much for being here. And I want to thank um, the City Commission for commissioning this Newtown Conservation Historic District project. It was under Fred Atkins' leadership. He became the first African-American city commissioner and he went out into the community to ask what residents wanted his priorities to be. And they said, preserve our history. We see what has happened to our community of Overtown, the first African American community to settle here in Sarasota. And they said, we don't want the history erased. So he got busy. He found a small grant through something called demolition funds. He worked with Dr. Cliff Smith and we started phase one. Phase one was a research report. It was oral history interviews and I interviewed Sheila among um, maybe 46 others. We collected uh, an inventory of historic places in Newtown. We found over 150 structures that were historic. We also produced some education programs. Phase two were historic markers, a really great website. I hope that you all have visited our website. We have a mobile app. And also, I've worked at um, a couple of places and I know how to leverage money. So we, we published a book. And there are podcasts now on the website. So I'm really, really proud of all of the work that has been done, stories, are at the foundation of what we do, telling Newtown's stories. And so today, we're gonna to hear a lot of stories from Miss Sheila, and I have been so blessed to hear her. Sheila, let's start by talking about your parents and how they made their way to Sarasota. You told me a story about how your dad came, uh, well, it, he didn't intend to settle here in Sarasota, but he did. Go ahead. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you all for being here. My father, UC Sanders, came here in the mid 40s en route to Miami from Crestview, Florida. However, there was a problem with the automobile and they had to stop in Sarasota for repairs. Well, he decided to stay in Sarasota and was here until his death a year and a half ago at 95 years of age. My mother came to Sarasota by way of Jacksonville, Florida, then on to Ellington. However, after the flood, and I believe that was in the mid 20s, they came to Sarasota, and I grew up in the home that my grandparents built on Osprey Avenue here in Sarasota. I'm impressed by Sheila's story because it shows how young people 
made a difference here in our African American community, and you all turn the tables upside down. But I want this audience to understand your upbringing. We talked about how you played, but you shared with me that because it was such a large family, not a whole lot of playing, there was not a lot of time for a lot of playing. We had lots of chores, <laughs> lots of chores. At that time, North Osprey Avenue was not paved, but they did have a liquid tar they poured on the road uh, rather frequently or infrequently, if you will, because that street was on the bus route. And the buses had to be able to travel that road without too many potholes. So we had Venetian blinds. They call them mini blinds now. But those Venetian blinds needed to be dusted every day except Sunday. And my mother, I thought, originated the white glove because uh, she would check your work. And if she found dust after you had cleaned, you had additional cleaning to do, not just on that project, but she'd give you additional projects. So you've heard of the expression neat nuts. We were not neat nuts, but everything was kept so neat that when people came to our home, they were surprised that as many children lived there as did. All right, and talk about fun. Did you have any fun? fun? Did you play games at all? Or was it all dusting? <laughs> it, it wasn't all dusting, but we did a lot of cleaning. Uh, the bottom line is that we lived with lots of our energy channeled not challenged, but channeled. So the decision on what we would do and when we would do it was made by our parents. We didn't have lots of latitude as far as deciding what you wanted to do after school, what you wanted to do before school, what you wanted to do on the weekend. And many of you probably remember when you had to pump the water and carry it in what we called a foot tub and then put it in a number 10 tub and wash it on a rub board and hang it on a line. So to this day, I love laundry because all you do is just press buttons. <laughs> Sheila, I swear you don't, you don't age. Okay, Thank can you. I say that? You, like that, you do not um, age. You talked about um, growing up for a time in the Overtown area and you said you could not cross 4th Street. 4th Street is um, just, it's in the downtown area. Why couldn't you cross 4th Street? Well, there was nothing saying you cannot. It was superimposed that you may not. As we all know from our English teachers, elementary through high school, that can speaks of ability and May speaks of permission. So we were told don't cross certain streets. So if you're told that by an adult, that was second only to the Holy Gospel. You did what adults said do. Now I realize that children today have a different take on that. But <laughs> during the time that I was in my early childhood, there were no options when it came to what adults said do. And adults set the pattern, unlike many adults today who are not setting the best of patterns, uh, but the pattern was set by the adult. And rather than being told that you cannot do something if it's imposed that you may not do it. An example of something that's very subtle was the want ads that you see in different store windows. Until the Civil Rights Act, all the ads said help wanted. Applicant supply inside. After the Civil Rights Act became law, a word was added to all those little signs, qualified applicants apply inside. That word qualified halted a lot of people. 
intentionally, unintentionally, it halted a lot of people because people never considered whether or not they were unqualified for a job if they wanted it. But suddenly when you add that word qualified applicants apply inside, it changed the dynamics of everything. And there have been a lot of subtleties along that line. And depending on your early upbringing, you see the same message but interpret it differently. You mentioned um, early upbringing and you said to me that you had to you had to say Miss so-and-so or Master so-and-so for children that um, were much younger than yourself. Remember you said um, something about um, white children that your mom or dad may have worked for, you had to miss them or master them? I didn't. I was told <laughs> that it was the way to talk to people, but sometimes if you are, and I was called contrary and rebellious on occasion, but I can understand that. <laughs> sometimes you just start talking to people without calling their name. And that's what I chose to do rather than miss and, okay. <laughs> or master anybody in my age group. Now, we were told, and there are people even 10 years younger than me that refer to me as Miss Sheila. But they expect differently from me than they do their peers in their own age group. So you say, what, one decade older? Yes. Think about all the ways that generations are defined now. Uh, baby boomers. Every, since World War II, we have to label each generation. Why? We're all one of a kind. We all have 206 bones floating somewhere through this body. And if one of them breaks, we all, all the other 200 plus recognize that that bone is broken. We're not doing that anymore as a community or as people. And at the time that I grew up, my early upbringing, we had three sources of reading materials in the home always. We had a Bible, a dictionary, and many, many catalogs. <laughs> so you learn to shop without actually making a purchase. And for that reason, I've never really been in debt. <laughs> All right. Tell us about your teachers, because I want this audience to understand um, how, you, how you grew up to become this activist that you became. You remembered the names of every teacher. Every teacher I had from Mrs. Ethel Reed Hayes in first grade impressed me in one way or another. Mrs. Hayes, my first grade teacher saw that because I had learned some things that some of the other children had not learned. She allowed me to go to the library every day after devotion. That was during the time we had devotion every morning at the start of the school day. You have to tell them about that Wednesday. Okay, we started school <laughs> day after Labor Day, which was Tuesday. And on Wednesday, the second day of school, Mrs. Hayes wrote the date as she had the day before on the board. And I raised my hand and I asked her why she spelled Wednesday that way. And she said, how do you spell it? And I said, I always use it in. And she looked at it and she realized that in her distraction, she had not written an N in the word Wednesday. And she said, you can spell Wednesday. I said, yes, ma'am. And she said, what other days can you spell? I said, all of them, there are only seven. <laughs> and I didn't, I didn't think there was anything odd about that. I thought everybody knew what I knew. And Mrs. Hayes would allow me to go to the library. Well, now, at that time, we were in what they call those World War II barracks up off the ground over on Orange Avenue. And Mrs. Hayes let me go after devotion to the library. Well, Mrs. Ruth Stevens was a librarian, and Mrs. Stevens taught me the Dewey Decimal System so that I could shelve books. 
and she let me read anything that I wanted to read. And I started reading early because I have a cousin who was approximately two years older than me. I thought she was a few months older than me. So everything she learned, I learned when she learned it. And Mrs. Stevens told Mrs. Ruby R. Williams, who was a third grade teacher, that she had a student who wasn't even in second grade yet that had read all the books for the fourth grade level for the reading club. And Mrs. Williams wanted to meet with me, and she did, and decided that she would allow third graders into the reading club. So in third grade, the reading club at Booker Elementary and the winged horse uh, all became part of what third graders could do. Prior to that, it had been fourth through sixth only. Third grade, very important year for you, third grade. I'd like you to know that this third grader organized a boycott of her classmates in third grade. It wasn't actually a, ball, uh, a boycott. It was actually an action against what I felt was unfair. And okay, tell us about this action that you considered unfair, Sheila. One of the local savings and loan organizations, in an effort to get us to bank with them, or have our parents bank with them, started accounts for all of us. So we would put our nickels and dimes, and some people even had a quarter, in those little folders. Every week they returned them back to school. And I happened to find out that they were doing tours at the bank. Well, they were not going to let our class do a tour of the bank. Why? They didn't tell us why. They just said no that they were not going to give us a tour. Well, now my mother was a housekeeper for someone who was a vice president at a different bank. So since I was familiar with his baseboards and window seals, because I cleaned them. You dusted them. <laughs> yes, <laughs> back to dusting. And uh, I asked him if his bank gave tours, and he said he didn't know, but he would check and let me know. So found out his bank did, would give us a tour. So our class toured his bank. And we didn't just tour the bank, we got to see the vault. <laughs> and uh, I have been what some people may term as precocious uh, since I was a little girl. So I didn't see anything unusual about asking him if my class could do a tour of his bank. What did you ask your classmates to do, however? Well, because they were being so unfair, I thought we would inconvenience them by putting only one penny in the envelope. And it would cost them more time and energy than they were going to make off of our pennies. So what I did, I had a babysitting job. And I was paid a quarter for babysitting. Well, I had 50 cents. We had four stores in my neighborhood on my street, and I went to Solomon's Grocery and asked Miss Verdame if I could have a roll of pennies for those two quarters. And she gave them to me. So I asked everybody in class to put in one penny. And then when the bank brought the envelopes back, they wanted to know why. And most of my class says Sheila Sanders told us to do that. <laughs> you were outed by a classmate. This is just the beginning. So how did you even know to do that? You were telling me that you were reading newspapers in second grade and third grade as you were going to the library? I went to the library every day. I still go to the library uh, weekly because everything there is free. And I have always worked from a budget. But at the library, we had, here in Sarasota, we had the Sarasota Herald and the Sarasota Journal for the afternoon paper. I would read those papers. I would read the St. Petersburg paper, the Tampa paper. We even had a Miami paper in the library. Again, everything is free. Costs you nothing but time to sit down and read it. So I would read about what was going on, not only here, 
but elsewhere mm -hmm. because there is a local section and they used to have what they called a Florida section and then a national section of the newspaper. And I would read and anything I was curious about, I'd do a little bit of investigating. And, and as a teenager, as a teenager, this young woman attended school board meetings and had the agenda delivered to her home. Is that right? They told me that I could. I don't think they realized I was still in my teens and in high school, but I called in and with my most professional voice requested <laughs> a copy of the agenda sent to, and they sent it. So I read it. And I not only attended school board meetings, I attended city and county commission meetings as well. See, what teenager does this? I don't know any. But you shared with me that you became a member of the NAACP Youth Branch. How did you become a member? That is the key. Mr. Humphrey's um, pharmacy played a key role in your becoming a member of that, and Mr. Humphrey himself, but share who Mr. Humphrey was. Mr. Hum Neil Humphrey of Humphrey Sundries was the first president. He organized this Sarasota branch of the NAACP, and at that time it was National Association for the Advancement of Colored Peoples, with an S on the end. And I saw the sign at the drugstore we, that's what we call, uh, Sundries. That's what we call his store, the drug store. <laughs> okay, he sold everything. And because he was such a kind man, he would take time and explain things, whether it was a medication, whether it was uh, making you a root beer float, whatever it was, Mr. Humphrey always had time for the people that he served. And I asked him what the NAACP and when it was getting started and if children could join. And he said that initially children could not, but they had no qualm about a child sitting in quietly. So growing up in a large family, you learn to be quiet, listen, but not speak all the time. So when the youth branch started, the first president of the youth branch was Ramar Harvin. And Ramar, actually I talk to him about once a month now, but Ramar, when he graduated in 1960 and went off to college, I was the most outspoken person, not the oldest, but the most outspoken person that was a member, so they made me the president. <laughs> you traveled with Mrs. Odessa Butler's mom she was an NAACP president. You traveled with uh, John Rivers. Both of them took you along with them. How did that impact your activism and your life? Just seeing what others were doing and not being limited to what you saw all around. Actually, when I was a young girl, I used to think when I become an adult and all of my friends will become adults around the same time, things will be different because we will make sure that they are. And between uh, John Rivers, whom I affectionately call JR, uh, and Mrs. Mays, whom I always called Mrs. Mays, <laughs> I traveled with them so much throughout the district. And John Rivers was from Mobile, Alabama, so he had seen some activism before he came to Sarasota uh, in the early 50s. But I spent so much time with them, there were people who actually thought I was their daughter. <laughs> I tagged along everywhere because my theory was if I'm not specifically uninvited, I'm invited. <laughs> How did it impact your life, seeing the proceedings and what was going on? Obviously, you were interested in what was happening with the with the movement and uh, community upbuild and community change. But how did attending with them and watching them in action shape who you are and your activism? I didn't see it as shaping me. I didn't see it as activism. 
I just saw it as me being me because I still have a curious attitude on many of the things going on in this world. And because of that, I will research. And again, the library is my friend. Everything is available to you in the library. And if you don't know exactly where to find it, they have somebody that you can call ahead and they will pull the books that you need on whatever the subject is. So I still use the library. And when I see things going on elsewhere, I'm thinking, that shouldn't be in isolation. Why can't it happen here? And I didn't see myself as putting myself out because when you have a younger sibling, you just do things that need to be done. So I saw it as doing something that needed to be done here in Sarasota because it had not yet come to Sarasota. I see. All right, um, more about your, your activist ways. We are dealing with a controversy with the Sarasota County Commission. Voters told the commission that they wanted single member district voting, just like you all did in 1980. Actually, the lawsuit was filed in 79. We had talked about it Talk prior about to that. that lawsuit and, and how the evolution of that lawsuit against the city of Sarasota, who had at large voting, but the residents of Newtown wanted single member district voting so that they could have a representative on the city commission. At that time, the difference between the city and the county was they, because they both had at large voting, but the county had residential requirements. You had to live within the district you wanted to represent. And the city, you, didn't, you could live anywhere within the city limits. And what incensed me was one evening when I was at a meet the candidates and three of the candidates for city commission were so sure of themselves they rode in the same car to meet the candidates. There were only three openings for the commission. And I thought, that's a lot of nerve. And I didn't appreciate it. So I thought, and they were all neighbors. They all live within a couple of blocks of each other. Now, they didn't all have the same view, but their views were not differing enough for me to appreciate. And I think you need some of the voices to be heard and not just under the open forums or when something is coming up for uh, a vote. I think you need somebody at the table all the time. And I talked to some other members of the community, uh, William Fred Jackson, whom we affectionately call Flint, Flick, uh, John Rivers, who was at that time president of the NAACP, and Edward E. James, or Edward Elliott, as I would tease him sometime, uh, and said, we need to take action because this is not going to get any better unless we do. So it was agreed that we would file a lawsuit. Well, we didn't go with the county because, again, the residential requirements. You at least had to live within the district you wanted to represent. So we filed it against the city of Sarasota in 79, and the first election after court case was in 1986. And actually, even after we had won the court case with an attorney who was very generous with his time and all his knowledge, the city wanted to delay implementation for 10 years. Oh Again, I was <laughs> incensed. <laughs> and uh, I think it's important that if you think something is wrong, you set about acting to correct what you consider to be wrong. If I don't represent anything else, I represent fairness. And even people who disagree with me to this day on whatever they disagree with me on, will say, well, at least she's always fair. The county commission was 
at large and then changed to single member and then changed back to at large? Actually, this was in the 80s and the county, the citizens of Sarasota County voted to make the county districts and district voting only. There was only one election that was done by district. And the county commissioners decided with the help of some influential people that wanted certain things done within the county and did not want certain other things done within the county that it should be back to at large. So the county commissioners with our tax dollars began a program to educate the voters to change it back to at-large voting. And it was done. And it was done. If you spend enough of other people's money, you can get a lot of things done. <laughs> what say you about what's happening now? It's an atrocity, nothing short. We have, every 10 years, a census that determines where the population is and how it's to be represented. There is no reason other than other people's money that the county commissioners are fighting this. If they had to present this with their own funds, it wouldn't be happening. But because we're using taxpayers' dollars to punish the taxpayers and tell the taxpayers what they really think, as though we don't have the ability to think for ourselves or know what we want in government, again, other people's money. And it should not happen. I'm very much opposed to it. And the commissioners are very aware that I'm opposed to it. Why? Because I don't mind getting on the telephone. I don't text, I don't tweet, I don't do all those things. I often tell people I don't have a cell phone, but I will make a telephone call and I will call and ask for an appointment in your office. Even when I go to Tallahassee, even without an appointment, I would stop by our local delegation and say, Sheila Sanders, Sarasota, sorry I missed you. Next time, perhaps we can have, I can have an appointment. Sarasota was a tough place, and uh, it was difficult for me gathering and understanding this history uh, when I was commissioned to do it. And I thought, man, I had no idea. I was looking and experiencing this history through a 10-year-old's eyes. Had no idea of the sacrifices, all of them that was made. I mean, my grandparents um, gave us an idyllic childhood, so we just didn't see all that you had to endure. For instance, um, you tell the story on our tour, on our trolley tour about how Longboat Key became uh, a town. Longboat Key was ready to incorporate because at a city commission meeting, the city of Sarasota said, so that we don't have them at our beaches. Them, meaning? Them, them meaning people of color. Those, they, the peoples that are referred to in the NAACP, peoples on our beaches, as though our tax dollars didn't go for those beaches too. Why don't we let them go to Longboat? Like who had transportation? People walked, took the bus, or maybe a taxi. We had our own taxi service. But Longboat said, well, we don't want them either. So Longboat, and as you know, because recently it's been in the newspaper and in all media, that Longboat is partly in Sarasota County and partly in Manatee County. It's highly unusual to incorporate. But the catalyst for incorporating was people of color, people that look like me. And uh, most of the people that were instrumental in getting that done. Actually, among those that filed a lawsuit in the, against the city of Sarasota, I'm the only one left 
the other three are deceased. Mm -hmm. But uh, many people don't realize where something started. And if you realize what started it, sometimes even when it's a good thing, if you know when it started and why it started and how it started, it makes a difference in your perception. And because I've always been curious, I do the deep research. And I was only a child, but I distinctly remember sitting there hearing, we don't want them on our beach. How did that make me feel? I've been in different homes that you cannot even afford. Cleaning, yes, but I was there. So how dare you decide that you don't want us on our beach? And my grandfather, my maternal grandfather, passed away in 55. He used to love going to what he called the water and just putting his legs in the water. You had to go at sunset. You had to go at sunset. So that you would not be seen. Well, most people leave the beach at sunset. I see. On the marker there at Lido Beach, it talks about how Miss Mary Emma Jones went to the county commission and asked for a colored beach because it was one of those unspoken rules. And so she was blown off. And then Neil Humphrey, whom you knew, whom you talked to. I also knew Miss uh, Mary, Mary Emma. Emma Jones. Yes. Uh -huh. Okay. I spent many, many, many days in her store. <laughs> okay, want you to talk and about Mr. Jack her? Jones was one of those taxi owners that I spoke of earlier. I want you to, to describe them too. But Neil Humphrey said enough is enough, and he started those car caravans. Now, I don't, uh, did you, you didn't ride in those car caravans. You just heard about them, right? No, unless I was specifically uninvited, I considered myself invited. and. <laughs> And I would talk my parents into letting me go with somebody that they trusted. So you would go then on Sunday morning? Yes, I would go. I was just told to be quiet, be still, be quiet. And uh, for some reason, everybody that's ever given me any instructions cautioned me on being quiet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I wonder why. <laughs> Sheila, what? You ran for office even. Twice in Sarasota County. Tell us about your running for office. When I didn't I, know that actually. Until when I you ran told for the time. Charter Review Board uh, back in 1980, it was because I read through the city charter and the county charter, and I didn't like some things that I saw, and I felt that if I was on the board, it would be easier to get those things changed in the charter, so I ran for the Charter Review Board. Uh, I'm not one of those people that think you need a lot of money to run a campaign, and to prove that, eight years later, I ran for the County Commission in Sarasota in 88, and uh, at that time, many people thought, she's too young to serve on the County Commission, but in 1980, I was the Democratic Executive Committee representative at the state level for the Florida Democratic Party. And I was co-chair of the congressional district at that time. And I am the only person in Sarasota who's ever represented Sarasota in three different congressional districts. We were the 10th and the 13th. 10th and the 16th, no, 10th and the 8th, because we went all the way over into Hardy County and all the way up to Polk County. So as the population expanded, we became the 13th Congressional District. But I represented Sarasota County in all of those from 80 to 84. And it's important that you do a lot of reading because you don't need to read between the lines, you just need to read each line. What happened to that in, in that election? I mean, was it before? Um, yeah, tell me about the election and running for county commission. I mean, it was at large, so you didn't stand a chance numbers-wise. Why not? 
and, and, and why not is actually the way that I saw it. I decided early on, working from a budget, I said, this is the amount of money I'm willing to spend on this effort. However, I am willing to be everywhere I am invited. And there were places that held Meet the Candidates that did not invite me. So one in particular, they had uh, the, a breakfast meeting and I had not been invited. So I did not show up, but I did call and have the hotel patch me through to the restaurant and asked to speak to the person that had done the invites to find out why I was excluded from the invitees. And he said to me, we invited people that have filed. And I said, well, did you get your information from the supervisor of elections? Because my fees have been paid and I am a candidate. However, I was the only Democratic candidate. So they felt that I didn't count. But I had a number of people tell me, even though you were not there, your impact was. Young people, young leaders, you certainly <laughs> are one and it started at a very, very young age. For the work that I'm doing, I'm looking for young people to help me to, I want somebody to pass this work off to. How do we get more young people involved in this process? Because uh, you don't have the energy that you once had, do you? Or do you? Or I don't have you? kinetic energy and potential energy. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 <laughs> and we all do. And we balance that energy. And it's just a matter of how you want to store your potential energy and how you want to use your kinetic energy. How are but you going to get those young people? We're going to invite young people. See, when I was young, er, <laughs> <laughs> right? I used to ask, and we children are very precocious. I'm a mother of four, and all four are still precocious. They're all adults. Uh, all independently taking care of themselves and on the verge of helping take care of their mother with something other than advice. But, <laughs> but we have to encourage and invite young people. How disrespectful do you consider it when you cannot remember somebody's name or somebody doesn't remember your name? You don't like it. Young people don't either. Remember, they are just as human. Same 206 bones, maybe a different size, but the same 206 bones. They have a mind. If we encourage them to use it, if we listen, think about all the times that somebody said, how are you today? And when you start talking, they start walking. <laughs> no, we need to communicate. You can only do that by listening and engaging. And if we engage the young people, they will be involved. Children can be challenged. We challenge, uh, challenge and channel adults. We can cha uh, challenge and channel children. That didn't go out in the 50s, it's still around. But we have to be willing to listen. Do you really want to hear what somebody else has to say or were you just being somewhat polite? when you said, how are you today? And not stereotype. Well, and not stereotype because you shared a story with me about your son, Aaron, who might be um, out in the audience, and the crayons. He better be. <laughs> uh, and the crayons. When my firstborn child was in kindergarten, this teacher called me, had me called to school because they thought my child might have had something mental going on. And her conclusion was drawn because she had given each child an animal to color. And my son color, had an elephant to color. Each ear was a different color. Each foot was a different color. The trunk was a different color. And they thought that was a sign of disturbance because even the other children that did not stay within the lines had one color for their animal. 
He's the only child that used every color he had. So when I'm sitting there with the principal, the teacher, the assistant principal, I say, well, why did he say his elephant had so many colors? They say, oh, we didn't ask him. I say, well, why not? <laughs> he has a reason. I know this child. He's been mine for five years now. Did you not? Why didn't you ask him? And they said, oh, we called you. And I said, well, let's get him in here so we can find out why his elephant had so many colors. What we found out is in trying to teach the children colors, the teacher had read a book about a little boy who was in a paint store. And they had all these various colors. So he decided that his elephant was in that paint store. And the elephant put one foot in this bucket of paint and another <laughs> foot in the other bucket of paint. And when he explained why his elephant had so many colors, suddenly it made sense to everybody there. And they said, how did you know? I said, I didn't know the, the what or the why, but I knew there was a why. And I have always encouraged, I call my children my four. My four to ask questions. And I listen intently when they give a response to a question I have asked of them. So if we want young people, if we want people, period, to be involved in what's going on, include them. People realize when they are uninvited. Mm. People realize when they are uninvited. And you cannot just smile and make that go away. First impressions do matter. And when I see people that say, you don't act your age, this is my age. What other age would I be acting? <laughs> you don't look your age. This is my age. What age would I look? So again, that's stereotyping. People think you don't know because subconsciously they don't want you to. And we don't want to confront our own isms. And if we don't confront our own isms, we're not going to go anywhere but in a circle just like a gerbil. Let's invite this audience to ask uh, questions now, Laura. Thank you so much, Sheila. That's, a, that's for starters. <laughs> That's for starters. Lights up. Ask whatever question of Sheila that you, that you wish. I think that uh, Walter Gilbert is in the audience somewhere. Where are you, Walter? He's in the back. OK, there you are. Would you take the mic to, uh, to Walter? Because he was all around, around and participated in that, in that single, single member, member district, district voting, voting issue. issue. Uh, uh, tell uh, your part of that, that story, story, Walter, Walter about, about it. it. Well, uh, can you hear me? Hear me? Yes. yes. Right, yeah. Loud and clear. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Hello. 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 <laughs> uh, for those of that don't know, I know some of you are going to know younger people, but uh, uh, I, I uh, uh, was, was a member of a group group that decided by to do that you would become the man you are today. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> Any other questions? There's a question. Can you get can you make it all the way over there? Why did you take a different view on those particular events in that case? Because 
although you weren't invited i don't believe they actually uninvited you because it was political see there's a difference between life and politics even though they're seriously intertwined because meet the candidates if you just show up they're not going to treat you as though you are a candidate and i knew that you just don't seem like someone who would put up with that pardon me <laughs> you just don't seem like someone who would have put up with that i, I think i find that curious uh, well, I, let's put it this way. At that time, I had a preschooler and a toddler, and that meeting was in Inglewood, which was 42 miles from my front door. And it was starting at 7 a.m. And I found out about it the evening before. Certainly, that's believable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Question. Yes, sir. Right down front. What would you like for us to take away from this discussion today? Treat everyone as you want to be treated. It's that old do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That is the rule of life in order to be fair. And that's what I would like everybody to take away. It's not difficult to be fair. And fairness is never out of order. It is always the order of the day. And if you treat everybody fair, fairness will come back to you. Because right now, you may not be that little old lady who needs help crossing the street, or that little old man who needs help reaching down for his newspaper. But one of these days, who knows what help you're going to need, who you're going to need it from. And I often use an analogy, it's if you saw life as an elevator that was stuck between floors, would you behave differently? Yes, you would. If you're on an elevator and you're stuck between floors, you don't choose by age, you don't choose by gender, you don't choose by economic level. Everybody on the elevator wants to do the same thing, get off safely. And that's what we have to realize. And if we start treating each other fairly, as though we are all part of this same big world, and that we can all do something to make things better. We're not just supposed to be consumers. Most of us have perfected consumerism, and we think that is the American way. That is not. That is not. It's part of it, but that is not the American way. So what we have to realize is that you can be the catalyst for the change you want to see. Start now. Why delay? Start now. Thank you, Sheila. There was another question. Oh in this area, where was it? I thought I saw a question there. Oh, there's a question. Inclusivity. See, we've had so much exclusivity that we don't realize when we are deliberately keeping people away. Let me give you an example. My middle son, who's a journalist, looked in a brochure for a new development, and he said, why don't why don't they like children? And I said to him, now he was a preschooler at that time. He said, I said, why do you think they don't like children? He said, there are no children in any of these pictures. No children. He was three years old 
looking in a brochure for a new development and concluded that they did not like pictures, children because of the pictures he saw in their brochure. If he's thinking this way at three, and he's, he'll be 35 tomorrow. <laughs> But he still always maintained that level of curiosity. And he pays attention to detail. So you can say, well, you are cordially invited. But is it a real invitation? Somebody is perceiving that you are being legalistic and following the law and saying you are invited, you are included, we want to hear you. I sometimes wonder why, rather than channeling our children's curiosity, we stifle it. We want to know why we don't have more participation. It's being stifled. It's being stifled. Some people would rather not vote than to vote for somebody that's going to harm them. But if you don't vote, it's out of your hands. And you don't have to control the whole picture, just control the part you can until you can control more. But as far as voter turnout, it varies. We had more, a higher percentage in 1960 of minority voters than we have had subsequent to 1960, even though we have had minorities on the ballot. Why? JFK. JFK, that young man made a difference. And lots of people thought that he represented hope. What we are doing, there's a line in the Lift Every Voice and Sing poem that says, Hope unborn had died. We're killing off hope. That's With our leaders that are in office right now, is that what you mean? They're not, um, they're not exuding hope. They're not uh, showing that we should have hope when you share that JFK um, let people know that they had hope? He represented hope for the future because he was so well-rounded. Most of us take a very narrow view on everything based on our own personal experiences, which is why I'm so into the library, because I don't need to experience everything in order to have empathy for everything, and we have an opportunity here in Sarasota because there are a lot of people who are engaged, a lot of people who are aware. But just think about it. How many of your friends do you not discuss religion or politics with? And yet they are your friends. But politics and religion are off the table among friends. What are we showing to strangers? If you cannot have a conversation with a friend, who can you have a conversation with? So I think that's part of it. People feel pushed away from the table, if you will. OK. Yes. Um, in turn, I totally agree with what you said about libraries, and I recognize that libraries are one of the last really free places that people can go and spend time and learn and share information, and I so love the North Sarasota Library and all that it offers to the residents and people here. In terms of voting, um, I want people to be aware that for over the past couple of years, every Saturday morning from 11 to about 2 in the afternoon, Many of us are there at Jetson's on the corner, Jetson's Beauty Shop on the corner of Osprey and uh, MLK, registering voters, walking the neighborhoods, canvassing the neighborhoods, and encouraging the newly returned citizens to register to vote as well. Um, and please come out any Saturday. Um, we're there, we're registering, and also over at um, um, Brother Lance's on Saturday morning, we're registering voters. 
shows and have been for over the past year, year and a half, we must get out for this next election the same way we did in uh, for President Obama both terms. Um, and it was the women, it was the black women and Latino women and black voters that put President Obama in the White House um, for two terms. And we can do it again by mobilizing those votes of all the wonderful black women in the community. And I wanna thank you so much. And Vicki, I wanna thank you so much. This is such a wonderful event for people to share incredible stories and history. And we thank you so much for that. And I wanna thank you. Thank you all. I wanna thank you for the work that you're doing in, um, in our community. I was born and reared in Newtown, and I feel like I have just as much a stake in the community as anyone does. And so my goal is to make sure that these stories are told. Books, children's books, podcasts, television um, shows, movies, city commission meetings, county commission meetings. You can better believe I'm going to be there and I'm going to be sharing a story about Newtown and its empowerment. Yep. Do we have any other questions? Good morning. I hear a voice. I'm here. Woo, I know that voice. Yeah, that's Charles Hill. I have one question and one statement. Yes, yes. sir. Sheila, how many children were in your family? We have three sets. My mother was wife number one. There were seven. All together, there were 18. Uh, 11 girls and seven boys. My statement is, I've known you for many years as your classmate, and I want you to know I'm so proud of you. And I see you as a modern day Harriet Tubman. Woo! <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Yay! For our area, yes, sir. Can, uh, where's the mic? We need to re record it. Like it's coming. It's coming. I'd like to ask you a question, Sandy. You talk a lot about your family and the things that you went through and the sacrifices that you made to do so much in the community. Those sacrifices that you made, I, I'm sure that the four are very thankful, and I'm sure that your siblings are very thankful. Could you do me a favor and talk a little bit more about your parents? Because I know the influence that both of them had on you as my mother, being you. Exactly. <laughs> That's my first born, you've been talking about. The one with the crayons and the elephant. As I said earlier, thank you, Aaron. Uh, my son, again, given to diversity, his first name is Aaron, A-A-R-O-N. My mother's maiden name was Moses. I have been a Sunday school teacher for 48 years, and for that reason, he was aware of the relationship biblically between Aaron and Moses. Well, when he was at Out of Door Academy in elementary school, he and I moved him from Out of Door Academy because I did not like the way he was being uh, treated at what was then Booker East, because they were seeing him as an exceptional little child of color. And I thought, there's nothing exceptional about him. Yes, he's mine, but there are many children who are just like him. And you should not look at a little child and think that they are limited because they have pigmentation. So when he was turning six, I asked him, what he wanted to do, where he wanted to go for his birthday. And he decided, I want to go to the Olympics in Montreal. <laughs> so subsequently, I went on a budget and we spent three weeks in beautiful Canada. And he's never forgotten that experience. But I have always tried to be the person that I say I am all the time, because one of the things that my dad taught his daughters, and my dad believed in double standards. He had one standard for the guys and one standard for the girls. 
But my mother always told us when she told us to do something, if you don't do it, I will kill you and be mad because you can only die once. <laughs> and my father told my brothers, if I tell you to do something and you don't do it or you talk back, I'll assume you're brain dead and kill off the rest of you. <laughs> now, this was said in love, but I distinctly remember my, my uh, brother saying, I wonder if daddy means that. And nobody ever challenged him. And I think we have to have high expectations of our children. We don't. We let somebody label our children. My son today is employed. He's never been unemployed. Why? He likes to eat. He likes to sleep in comfort. All the things that he had at home as a child, he expects to have now. And Sheila, your son said, describe the influence of your mom and dad. Telling us what to do, when to do it, and not telling us twice. <laughs> and I think that they exposed you in a beautiful way. I exposed my four, likewise, mm -hmm. to everything that I was interested in. Yeah. My daughter was in town last week, so we went to Rigoletto because she had not seen that opera. She loved Birdie. And we have been to many operas over the years. When they were children, they went to uh, the youth opera camp. They also went to piano camp and uh, summer strings at the symphony and uh, basketball at uh, the Jewish Federation and Exposure. Little League. Yes, uh -huh. and I, I think it's important. You know, we spend money on what we want to spend money on. And my son that was just talking, will tell you that he will not take me shopping because he took me shopping and he says, you've been in this store 27 minutes and you haven't seen anything. So what does he do? He buys me gift certificates. <laughs> there was a question. Yes, sir, you have the mic. Yes. Um, my name is Willie Clemens and this is my wife. Hi, Mr. Clemens. Um, Welcome to you. Sarasota from Atlanta. Absolutely. And Mm -hmm. okay. And hearing you today sort of brought back a lot of memories, childhood memories, very, very singular. And so I want to thank you for that. But we also, I want to just say, how can the message that was so powerful that you gave today should resonate in this city, certainly among us as African Americans, certainly for our children and for, for the youth and all, but for this entire community. How can this message be communicated on an ongoing basis? You've left a legacy. You are an excellent role model. And our youth, and not only our youth, but our students need to see that. And how can we emulate that? And how can we continue what you have started in this city? I think you're aware that there is this new wave of African Americans that have come to Sarasota, and I guess we are a part of that. And so we want to help make this city great and continue the legacy that you have started. So we need to be told, we need to hear these stories, okay. and so that we can con continue to what you have started and we can also pass this on to our children, our, the youth, and this entire community. And again, my hat's off to you, Dave. Thank you. Because uh, you have made a commitment to tell the story, and we are here to help you to do that. And so I want to just ask in terms of yeah. advice from, from you, how do you think that we can become so engaged and continue the legacy that you have started in this city. Sheila, let me take that first, okay? I talked about phase new one of this Newtown project. Mm -hmm. I talked about phase two. Phase three is an art center and history museum that showcases stories 
like you've heard on this stage and others that you haven't heard, we're going to build this facility and we'll need all of the community's uh, help. I've visited um, African American history museums throughout the country, just a few, to see how they've put them together, how they're um, showing history about the transatlantic slave trade and about state history and about local history. And it, it's beautiful the way it's all laid out. I want to leave this as a legacy um, to our community and to the countless visitors, the 2.6 million who come here to visit our beaches. This facility can also be a destination where tourists come to learn about what happened here in Sarasota because for so long these stories have not been told and there are communities around the country where these stories are not being told. But aren't we blessed here in Sarasota that somebody had the foresight to start this project with the seed, $50,000, and they gave it to the right person to do something with. And I'm gonna leverage the hilt out of it until the day I go on to glory. Sheila. Thank you all so much for being here. And I will be available if anybody has a question they didn't want to ask publicly uh, after this setting. But I often say my life is an open book. Perhaps not easily read, but an open book. <laughs> because I tend not to live according to the expectations of others but I've got my personal expectations. I have my personal minimums that I will do. I have my personal minimums that I will accept. And there are many people who want to see all boys grow up to be gentlemen and all girls grow up to be ladies. But when you see a small child, how do you engage that child? as though that child has that potential? Or do we only look at the stage that child is in now? And if you really want things to be better, you be better. Are you doing the best you can every day at everything you do? What are you most proud of when you reflect on your own lives? can't think of anything, change something. Give yourself a reason to smile. Your best effort is worth a smile. And if I had to say anything in closing, just know that you are special. If not to everyone, to someone. Grasp that, embrace that, and be special. Be special. You are. Okay, thank you. We're going to move over to the, the Glass Museum and we can Pavilion. talk and meet and greet and share a drink or two. Thank you so much for coming.